With William Shatner in the driver's seat, Star Trek V The Final Frontier would get closer and closer to take off. But with more story and budgetary problems, along with Star Trek The Next Generation being seen as a mixed bag, no one knew what to expect from the film. And once it was released, everyone's worst fears were confirmed. Hello and welcome to Backtrack, a web series that focuses on the background information on any given topic in Star Trek. In this, the continuation of our look into Star Trek's history, we'll be taking a look at the making of Star Trek V The Final Frontier, and all the drama that surrounded the making of this box office flop. I hope you enjoy. Star Trek V had many problems, but the main one was the story for the movie itself. Shatner's original vision was for the crew to actually go on a quest to meet God, only to find him and have it turn out to be the actual devil in disguise. This was a huge problem for both Paramount and Gene Roddenberry, and if you think about it, their trepidation makes a lot of sense. You see, Star Trek V as written would have seen the Christian god and devil as being the right god. Can you imagine the outrage? Besides many other religions existing on this planet, we have to think about all the atheists who don't believe in God at all. This film would essentially be saying, hey, you non-believers, and those of other faiths, you're all wrong. The Christian God is right, and the only God, so in your face. And so Paramount demanded that be changed. And to accommodate this order, Shatner would change the God-Devil to an entity only posing as God, and the line about one god, many faces, would be added. The inclusion of the character of Cybok as Spock's half-brother, and how the movie dealt with it, is another great example of horrible story elements. Up to this point, we as fans had no idea Spock even had a brother at all. It was something never discussed in TOS, yet suddenly, here he was. And a lot of fans took exception to that, and I don't really blame them. But for me, that part really wasn't the problem. The problem for me stemmed from the fact that supposedly Spock never told Kirk about his half-brother in all the years they had served together, and this just didn't really make sense to me at all. Cybok would be played by the talented Lawrence Luckinbill, though he didn't have an extensive acting career in television and films, preferring to focus on his Broadway-style career. I've always felt he did an excellent job in the role, however. He displays just the right amount of feeling to make an audience slightly uncomfortable with the character, while at the same time making that same audience question whether or not what he's saying might be true. Todd Bryant would come on board as the Klingon Captain Claw, and Spice Williams Crosby would join as Vixis, Claw's lieutenant. Bryant was playing ping pong at a beach party when a casting director offered him the role, and he actually performed his audition twice, as Shatner requested that he repeat his original performance again, but this time speaking in Klingon. And this second audition landed him the role. Todd Bryant is an interesting person as he is actually a stuntman, who appeared as an actor in three Star Trek films. He was a cadet in Star Trek II, Claw in Star Trek V, and the Klingon translator in Star Trek VI. He was also the stunt double for Ron Perlman in Star Trek Nemesis. Williams Crosby thought Vixis was Kirk's girlfriend when she arrived for her audition, and at first was distressed when she found out that she would be playing a Klingon, but quickly realized that it would be fun to play a villain. Spice would have an average acting career throughout the rest of her life. David Warner, Charles Cooper, and Cynthia Gao would play the Federation Klingon and Romulan ambassadors to Nimbus III. Warner actually didn't audition, rather Shatner simply offered him the role, and he agreed to beam down to Nimbus III only after Shatner promised that his character would survive in the film. Bill Quinn would make a cameo as Dr. McCoy's father. Quinn had an extensive acting career which started out in 1923, and his role in Star Trek V would be his last. A little bit of Trek trivia for you all here was that the name Shakari was a play on the name Sean Connery, 
the actor Star Trek producers and Shatner originally wanted to play the character of Cybok. Unfortunately, Connery was busy working on Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and was unavailable to play the part. The filming schedule for this movie would also contribute to its downfall in my opinion, as setting up shots for filming would often take hours to do, but in this movie, the time allotted for setting up new shots was only minutes. That meant that the shots tended to be bland and uninspired, as no time existed for any complex shots to take place. Scenes like the campfire chats had to be filmed up close and personal, with bland framing simply because time and constraints didn't allow the production team to build the tops of the trees on the set. Then of course there's the treatment of the USS Enterprise herself in this movie. Here we had a new hero ship, one that is supposed to replace the original that we had all fallen in love with. Suddenly, the Enterprise is reduced to a sight gag factory. I think many fans will agree that when you think of the Enterprise's first outing, she just can't compare to the original. Along with the problems in the story, there were also many issues with in-universe canon within the film. For example, how exactly did the USS Enterprise reach the center of the galaxy in less than a day? This trip should have taken decades, see Star Trek Voyager. Or how about how the Enterprise now has almost 80 decks, numbered 1 to 80 from the bottom of the ship? Fans of Star Trek always notice these problems, and although the novelization of the film does attempt to explain away these things, at least mostly, with having Cybok modify the Enterprise for it to travel faster and have better shielding, with the Klingons shadowing the Enterprise and making these same modifications to their own ships having scanned the Enterprise's mods, I personally am of the feeling that a person should never have to read a novelization in order to explain away any mistakes, let alone obvious ones. And speaking of the novelization, Star Trek V The Final Frontier would be penned into book form by the talented J.M. Dillard, and the book itself is an excellent read, giving far more depth to the story than what we see on screen. Like Roddenberry on Star Trek The Motion Picture before him, Shatner didn't have a very good grasp on the purse strings for his movie. And in order to save money for the film, many TNG sets would be redressed and reused. During location shootings, locals were hired to portray Cybok's army during his raid on Nimbus 3. But because of severe budget and overspending, many of these were reused in different shots and at different angles, running through the gates over and over again to make it appear as though there were far more extras involved than there actually were. One unexpected cost for the movie was the Enterprise Bridge itself. At the end of Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, we got a glimpse of the new bridge, flat panels and all, and it was the intent to reuse this bridge for the movie. However, during a storage shift, the bridge set was actually left outside in one of Paramount's parking lots, and as luck would have it, a severe rainstorm would lay waste to that bridge, forcing an entire rebuild of it. And since it was a new movie with a new ship, the decision was made to create an entirely different and new looking bridge that would begin to tie the TOS era to the TNG era. The final climax of the movie would have had Kirk attacked by 10 large rockmen emerging from the rock faces of the planet. This was a very expensive idea, and as a result, only one rockman was created. The scenes involving the Rockman attacking Kirk were in fact filmed, but turned out so horrible that Shatner was forced to remove the entire sequence from the movie. Star Trek V The Final Frontier premiered on June 9, 1989, and grossed only $52 million in North American box office sales and a dismal $17 million overseas. I think it should also be mentioned here that Star Trek V had a lot of competition when it came out. Huge blockbusters like Tim Burton's Batman, Lethal Weapon 2, Ghostbusters 2, and even Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And although this probably did impact the film's success slightly, the truth is that had Star Trek V actually been a good movie, then nothing would have prevented fans from going to see it once or even multiple times 
but it just wasn't a good film. Add to this the fact that Trek fans were generally displeased with the course that Star Trek as a franchise was taking. Star Trek The Next Generation had finished its lackluster second season by this point, and no one was super impressed with that. So fans of Trek weren't really excited or interested in seeing what Star Trek V had to offer in the first place. So when the fans that did see it began spilling their long list of complaints about the film, well, its fate was sealed. The film was even the winner of the 1990 Razzie Awards for Worst Picture, Worst Actor William Shatner, and Worst Director again William Shatner. It also received nominations for Worst Picture of the Decade, Worst Supporting Actor DeForest Kelly, and Worst Screenplay. Bandai, working for Nintendo Entertainment Systems, was actually slated to create a Star Trek V action game to be released in 1989 along with the movie. The game was cancelled following the failure of the film at the box office. A prototype version, though, has surfaced online in more recent years, and is notable for its many basic spelling errors, and its lack of any ending, most likely due to it being scrapped before its completion. I just wanted to take another moment here to put in my two cents about the film itself. You see, I don't really dislike it at all personally, but I get why fandom as a whole does. To me, Star Trek V seems like an average episode of TOS, and although it does have its obvious flaws and technical problems, I've always felt that the characters in the movie feel a lot closer to their original series counterparts than in any other movie. There are some really excellent moments in this film that should never be overlooked. But Star Trek V The Final Frontier was simply one of those films that suffered from the weight of the story it was attempting to tell, and the position of the fanbase on Star Trek at the time. It was considered so bad by the critics that even the studio itself thought that the movie had ended the TOS movie franchise for good. But like a phoenix, as always, the Star Trek movie franchise would rise again from the ashes, once again saved by Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan director Nicholas Meyer. And this last official TOS adventure would not only give our beloved heroes a proper send-off, but would also reaffirm fandom's faith in the Star Trek universe at large. But when we next return to this Star Trek historical overview, we'll be switching gears again to take a look at the production of Season 3 of Star Trek The Next Generation. We'll see you then. Thank you for watching today's episode of Backtrack. What do you think of Star Trek V The Final Frontier? Do you think it deserves all the negative hype it gets from fandom? Well, leave your comments in the section below, and don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Want to help the channel toast some marshmallows? Then consider becoming a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching, and I still want to know, what does God need with a starship?